All right, we are back. We are live. It is the Dev Talk Show on August the 12th of 2020. Uh, we're here as we like to start around 8.30 p.m. here on the U.S. East Coast. I've got my co-hosts, Rich Ross and Andy Schwamm here. And for the both of them, I'm Chris Gomez. So thank you for joining us. If you're joining us live on Twitch, thanks. And if you're watching us on a recording on YouTube, then thanks for joining us there too. And please be part of this conversation, either in the comments below or in the chat right now. And you know, hey, it's been a while, right? It's been a few months, but we are back for our second year of the Dev Talk Show, which premiered on August 7th of 2019. That was year one, season one, if you will. And so, you know, it's been a great year. We've had a lot of great shows. We had some great guests, good topics. I, I'm just wondering after all that, you know, Andy, like what does the Dev Talk Show mean to you after year one? Yeah, first of all, I, I got to address that. Like year one, I cannot believe we're a year into this already. I and mean, that's just exciting. I, when we started this, I mean, I, I still feel like we have that same excitement, each, all three of us, when we talk about doing this show, we're still like equally as excited to, to do this and like, wow, what can we do to make the show better and all that, you know? So I'm, I'm so psyched that we're all, we all feel the same way, I think. You know, what does this show mean to me? I, I think this show, what we're trying to do here is sort of have an extension. Uh, we, we've talked about this, right? It, it's sort of like people go to meetups a lot and, uh, you know, they see a presentation, but then after the meetup, there's these like conversations that happen. And sometimes right. we call it the parking lot conversation or the hallway yep. conversation yeah. or something like that. Right. And we're trying to combine. I think what we're trying to do is combine those two things. In other words, we, we have technical content. We have, presentation it might not be as scripted as like a formal user group presentation right but we bring that conversation into the show so that the viewers can like ask questions or make suggestions and say hey why and quite frankly often it's it's the three of us saying wait why and we're right, learning yeah. and yep. and we're asking each other questions and it's those questions and it's that conversation that makes the show great and what i've said before i learned something from every one of these shows, I learned, I learned something, and it's great. Yeah, right. And so you, just like you said, it's great to not just learn from each other, but also learn, you know, from the guests or from the chat. And so I think, I think Rich, you've figured, you've been compiling some statistics of year one, right? So what, what do we have? Yeah. So a little bit of uh, stats that we have. So we have. 32 videos up on our YouTube channel, and those are all perpetually up there from our, for archive. Uh, we've taken a little bit of hiatus over the summer. That's why we don't have you know close to the 52 that you would expect after doing this for a year. Uh, but what's been great about that though is we have over that one year's worth of time, we have 161 subscribers, uh, 2,600 views, and about 320 hours of time watching uh, the videos there. And we're, we're starting to get more and more comments recently from some of the older videos there too, which is really awesome. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's great about it too, is, is that even if the video, or if, if we shot the show six months ago, it can be relevant to what you want to take to work tomorrow. And that's okay. You know, the show is there, the comments uh, keep going. And in that conversation continues there as well. So if you are joining us live, you know, we've got our good friend Chops in the chat room already. And yeah. uh, if you're joining us live and you have a Twitch account, feel free to join in on the chat. Uh, if you would like to be part of the conversation, we'd love to have you. Um, otherwise, we're just glad you're here. That is the most important thing as we just, we are taking what we've learned and trying to help folks. But at the same time, we learn from you. So do not hesitate to teach us while we're here tonight. And, you know, we were trying to think about our restart and how do we get back into this, into this, uh, uh, into our show and what we're going to do. And what came up was, it was actually one thing I said is, is that I, I've been to, um, I've been to talk so many times about the solid principles, which often apply to, uh, they're often used in object oriented programming languages, but really I think programming in general benefits from some of these principles or all of them. And I remember saying out loud, you know, I still struggle a lot with how much to apply this and when, and what does it look like when I have it right? And so we have, uh, I think Andy, we have tonight, we're going to start off with the first letter in solid. They all stand for something. And, and we're going to, you know, I think if, if you're ready, we can get right into 
understanding what the, the solid principles are in coding and how they can help us uh, when we go to work. Yeah, that'd be great. It'll be, it'll be, it's a fun conversation. Uh, by the way, we also got a hi there from uh, MRK Ready. How's it going? Um, you know what? What Chris was saying, like if you're here and you and you are logged in and you have an account and you want to say hi, we love it. We like just having some fun, you know, make a joke or whatever. It doesn't even have to be, you know, all that serious, right? Like it's, it's like join in on this and and, and have fun with us. Um, we'll be great. Yeah. So um, we've been talking about, uh, you know, we wanted to do the show on the um, solid principles or a series of shows and. In addition, we wanted to start off and do like, I think it was Chris's idea, like what if we did a show on each of the uh, solid principles, right? And quite frankly, um, I've done these talks on these, uh, at, you know, at user groups and code camps and things like that. And uh, and we will often will cram the whole thing into a one hour like presentation, but that's not what this is. This is a conversation, right? Um, before we dig into that, I wanted to talk about the why, because to me, that, that might be the most important part of the whole conversation is like the why, right? Why do we need design principles? Well, building software is hard. Let's just be clear about that, right? Maintaining and changing poorly designed software is costly. Now, when I say costly, I don't just mean money. I'm talking about time right? And stress and uh, the, the lost cost, what do you call it? Like missed opportunities by not adding new features because we're busy trying to fix and change poorly designed code and stuff like that. So uh, fragile code leads to code that's buggy, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and bugs are costly. Changing bad code is really hard, right? And what we want is is we want to design quality software, right? Now, again, this I think is the most important thing is the takeaway is why do we want to follow these principles, right? And we'll then we'll get into why these certain principles are helpful, right? We're not going to spend a lot of time on why isn't this slide moving? So, Hang on a second. Let me, so let me ask why you're working on the slide. So yeah. is what you're saying here, like you say some things like changing bad code is really hard. So that leads yeah. naturally to the like, well, well, what does bad code look like? And, and right. maybe... If I can just offer real quick is that as programmers, you're giving instructions to the computer. Like that's that real layman's point of view, right? But I could give you instructions to go to the store and I could make it really complicated, overly complicated. And then you get to the store and and you personally, it's you're trying to follow this complex thing. But to make things worse, let's say I called you in the middle to make a change to what I asked you to do at the store. But the thing, the instructions I gave you were so complicated that you kind of get my change wrong and then you don't come home with what was asked for. And so right. that's why, you know, in a really horrible analogy, that's why you, we could just write code and it could work just fine. If as long as the instructions are correct, then yeah. does it really matter? But that's not true at all. It does matter because you, you own this software and you're going to have to keep working on it day after day for years, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I, I'm vague in these slides, you know, I say changing bad code, like what is bad code, right? Well, disorganized, hard code, we'll get into like how the solid principles help, but we're trying to move away from having bad code, right? Um, so what should code be, I think, right? My feeling is, and I think a lot of the stuff people would generally agree on, code should be less error prone than more error prone, right? The less error prone it is, the better. It should be easier to maintain. It should be easy to read, less breakable, more reusable, more decoupled. This is what I'm shooting for, right? This is my goal um, because I find, and this is like a big takeaway. People often talk about like, what problem are you trying to solve, right? To me, in an enterprise organization where I, where I happen to be, right? The problem isn't always the, the the biggest problem is is maintenance. It's like we want to be able to quickly turn out features, right? Our our biggest problem isn't shaving a tenth of a second off of performance. And I'm not saying performance isn't important, right? But that's not the problem I'm trying to solve, right? If I was building some sort of like I always use the example like if I was building the robotic 
arm that's used in sort of surgery, right? And maybe my problem, well, I'd still want to accomplish all these things, right? I'd still want it to be less breakable and things like that. But but I might be really focused on, you know, performance or like this, you know, accuracy to like this minute level, right? And I'm not trying to be dismissive of enterprise code, but we're doing a lot of crud in and out, data in and out, right? And so the biggest thing that we want to do is always be able to just add features and make the applications better for what the business wants us to do. That's sort of like, you know, sort of where I'm going with this, right? Yeah, so um, NFT Codex, you know, first of all, he wanted to clarify, is this interactive, right? Because we we hadn't, uh, I, I think maybe we hadn't um, jumped in with chat for a while, but he did make a comment here because a lot of times, you know, you sit there and, and you're trying to you're trying to meet all of these principles that you've put up here, easier to maintain, easier to read yep. code. And he said, I'm OK with losing a cycle or two for legible code. And you said easier oh, yeah. to read, easier to maintain. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So losing that, a cycle. That's what I'm talking about here, right? Go slow to go fast. Is that kind of that principle? Go slow to go fast. Um, well, yeah. I think that um, some people often say when you get into like these design principles, when you get into like really caring about architecture, you're like, but it takes a long time. I want to just go in and start typing in stuff, right? And make it work. And it will, let's face it, if you're a good developer, you know, you could do that. You could go into your, you know, editor, start banging through this thing and bang out a feature really quick. And yes, are you going to ship faster? It's possible you might ship faster, but day two is going to be worse, right? Um, and it's also possible you won't ship faster because you're going to find out that, oh, you know, I can't unit test this thing or it's just a mess, right? And so, um, yeah, so this is, you know, this is great. And and so great to see the, the, the chat and all that's going on. Totally, is this, is this interactive? You bet, right? Um, so, oh, sorry, again with the slide here as I change. Yep. So... So uh, like he says, bit. code is not for machines, right? It's for people. Yeah. And, and, the, for and machines, the, yeah. the, the reason that I wanted to bring that up is because that this is a classic quote that we are, uh, that we're cribbing here a little bit. Um, it's a good one. You know, Harold Abelson, a professor at MIT, uh, is known for saying programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. And so, <laughs> you know, I love it. Only incidentally, right? Like, oh, it just so happens that machines are going to execute. And he wrote this in the structure interpretation of computer programs in absolute classic, right? That that I think maybe, look, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I've read it cover to cover, but I will never forget that quote. It's a good one. And I appreciate you sharing it because I, I don't think I've ever seen that quote before. You know, that's that's great, right? So again, I want to move quickly into what we want to talk about for the core thing today, but I want to also mention it. We're talking about design principles. Design principles are not implementations. They're not patterns, right? And the principles aren't really specific about how you achieve the goal that you're trying to achieve, right? And that's where a lot of the questions come in because people get the principle, but they don't really get like, wait, how should I implement this principle? Or is there only one way to, you know, I've done it this way. Well, there's a lot of ways to implement a lot of these principles. There's a lot of ways to interpret these principles. And that's really what we're going to start talking about, I think, because I think that's all I had on these slides. And so having said that, I want to go right up on my screen and I've got Visual Studio here and hopefully you're seeing nice. that. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I'm looking at the Twitch. It's a couple seconds behind there, you know, so, okay. So what I wanted to do is put together some samples. Oh, what I didn't, sorry, I, I, I did forget something. Hang on. Um, we were going to talk about, oh, sorry, the uh, solid principles of oriented, uh, object-oriented and agile design. I think Chris sa said that earlier, that it's, it's it, that's what they're called. But I use these solid principles when I'm writing JavaScript, I try to apply them if I'm writing a SQL stored procedure. You know what I mean? Like, I think they're valuable enough that you might not be able to take it to the level, uh, you know, to the nth degree that you might in object-oriented programming. But I think that these principles really relate to any code you write. That's my opinion. And I don't know, but what do you guys, have you guys sort of tried to apply these things in other ways? Okay, so um, earlier, I had said 
that solid, all of the solid principles are often applied to object oriented languages. Um, I certainly think as we talk tonight about single responsibility, that there's one that in my opinion is pretty darn universal for everything we do as developers. Yeah. You yeah. Yeah, totally. So the solid principles, basically what they're about, and we're going to jump into the first one, but the solid principles are about dependency management, right? Poor dependency management leads to code that is hard to change, fragile, and non-reusable. And that's the stuff we said we didn't want, right? We want what it says on the other hand, when dependencies are well managed, the code remains flexible, robust, and reusable. Well, what's a dependency? That's a whole other question, and, and hopefully that's going to make sense. But let's talk about the single responsibility principle. And the, def the, the definition of the single responsibility principle is not actually what a lot of people say it is. When, when I ask people what's the single responsibility principle, usually they say, well, a class should do one thing. And that's actually not the definition of the single responsibility principle. It's that a class should have one and only one reason to change. And there's a subtle difference there. You, you, you know, and again, there's a lot of interpretation that goes on when we're talking about design principles. But a class should have one and only one reason to change. Now, clearly, if a if a class, and I might have I might have changed the wording on this. It might be actually a module, you know, because you could talk about things generically, right? Not everything uses classes, a module or a class or whatever it is, right? Um, if it only does one thing, then it's likely that it only has one reason to change. But the single responsibility principle uh, can really be interpreted in a lot of ways. And so I want to go into some examples and then hopefully the definition should sort of um, reveal itself, right? You know, like it should make more sense. And I think a lot of people find that like the single responsibility principle, probably of the five principles on paper, you know, sort of like the easiest one to go like, oh, I get that, right? It should only do one thing or it should only have one reason to change, right? Open, closed, you know, sort of has like a complicated name. Some of the names of some of the other ones are like, what, well, what? Let's take a look. The best way to understand these principles, I think, especially with single responsibility, is to look at what is not the single responsibility principle. Okay? okay. And so I have this class here, and the class is called the converter, or not the, the class is called converter. And I've got some little classes in this uh, library. This library doesn't run, it doesn't really do anything, right? It's just for demo purposes. But we have something called a customer. Right, and let's assume that the customer is is an object that we probably have in our database, and maybe when we query that database, we often have to turn it into different DTOs to to return to a UI. So in this case, there's a customer list item DTO, meaning I want to return and have a UI that has like a list of customers. Right? Maybe I have a customer details page, and so I want to take a customer and get the details out of it or something like that. Now you can tell my um, my implementations of these are weak. And this isn't really about the implementation. The implementation here is irrelevant. What we want to be thinking about is this class and these methods. And don't worry the fact that I haven't really implemented these things, OK? Try to look past that. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay. like we could imagine that this class converts to list items, converts to yeah. details, converts to customers. Right. And I, I don't care what the code looks like. Yeah, C dot name equals customer list item dot name, you know, blah, 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 right? We, we know how to write that code. So, so I'm taking this customer, I'm turning into a list item, taking it, turning into a detail, taking a, oh, I'm going in the other direction. I'm taking like the editing, you know, the input from the UI, and I'm turning it into a customer. Oh, and yes, I'm taking these three strings and I'm turning it into an employee. Wait, what? Right? my alarm bells like go off in my head immediately. Like, what, what are we doing? We got customer, 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 employee. Sounds like-, like Sesame Street song, which one of these don't belong, <laughs> right? Yes, yes. Now, this doesn't really add up to the single responsibility principle. I've got four different methods in here and one of them is dramatically different than the other three. Okay, so I would say let's take a look at a better converter, right? And the name of things, I find that when I name things properly, everything tends to work out better. And right off the bat, I name this thing converter. 
wait, what? Like converter? This thing was built to convert anything to anything because it's just a converter, hmm. right? It's not specific at all. Now, if I named it the customer to list item converter, okay, now we're getting specific. And I have this method called convert. And it takes the C, customer, sorry, and it turns it into a customer list item. In the true sense of the word and the true sense of the definition, I would say this is very single responsibility principle. Okay? Because this does one thing, all right? And it's really only going to have one reason to change. The reason to change would be that the business logic for converting a customer into a list item has changed. That's like the reason, right? Okay. Now, you may be thinking, and this is where the interpretation on these principles really gets like hazy. You might think like, well, that looks like a lot of work. Are you saying, Andy, we should take this converter and convert this into four classes, right? Where each class has one method. And my answer to that is, well, you could do that. And I don't think anyone would argue that that isn't like purely single responsibility, but most people would say that's hard to maintain, right? It's one thing to split things up in certain ways, but you could take these things to a level where it's potentially too far, okay? If I was doing this, and by the way, I am, <laughs> right? I would probably do this. I would probably have the customer converter and the customer converter's job is to convert a customer into various things, okay? Now, there's no implementation here, again. So these things on paper seem really similar and really simple. And I'm gonna say, in my definition, and this is, again, this is personal opinion, but in my definition, this is okay, all right? Because, um, because they're kind of related and this is where, quite frankly, like this, it's okay to disagree. You might say, yeah, but Andy, I really like this, okay? I want to have everything in there. And I would never argue with that. But my feeling is I would likely have a customer converter. And then that other one, I guess I forgot to do this. I didn't really, I should have done it. But I would have this employee converter in its own class. And that's class job is to convert employees into things. Okay. Does that make sense with the way you guys have interpreted the single responsibility principle before? Right. And well, I see right on the comments, uh, NFG Codex says, you know, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. Right. And that is the, the truth. There's a lot of ways to do this. Right. Yeah. So you are drawing a line in the sand that that fourth method is out of here. That, yeah, that at totally. the very least, it's so different from what the rest of the customer converter is trying to do that it's that it's clearly you know it's just kind of it's like you're just finding a box to throw an old toy in mm -hmm. and then now somebody's got to go find it later exactly right now where where the line the line is a subtle line this this line of like crossing it or not crossing it because we talked about these 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 methods earlier and we said well what would a method look this look like and it would probably be like something like uh, I'll just, uh, sorry, let me just do something like this. Uh, DTO equals new uh, customer list of DTO, right? And then we would do this, right? We would say like, I don't even know if this thing has any properties because I was goofing around. It doesn't even have any properties, right? But it would be like first name equals uh, C dot first name, right? This is what you'd expect the code to look like, right? And if I had like 10 lines like this in each one of these things, I feel pretty good about it. But then maybe we get down to this bottom one and this bottom one has different complexities, right? It has to do, and again, we're talking about com customers and it's probably not that complicated, but if this converter had to do calculations and do all these other kind of things and it's starting to get where this one is long now, you know what I mean? This, uh, well, I would hopefully never have it be that long, but this one's got lots of like logic in it. Maybe I would say, hey, you know what? Maybe this thing should be in its own class for some some reason, right? Because I just feel like it's getting it's getting messy. Um, but it's a subtle line, um, and I hope that makes sense. And I have some other examples that I think sort of show 
things that go together, in my opinion, and things that don't go together. Um, but if this makes sense, I'll, I'll move to another example. I'm just cleaning this up because I'm like totally uh, not ADD. What's the word? I don't know. I couldn't handle like that. You know, there was there was spaces in there. Right. So so another example is the old classic, you know, repository. Right. And again, the name here is almost a dead giveaway because I called it repository. Right. So this thing can get a Per, oh, I, I renamed some of these things. It could get an, an employee. This is supposed to say get employee, right? Get employee. Sorry, fixing my code here. Get employee, add an employee, delete an employee. That sounds like a repository. But wait, get manager, add manager, delete manager. Again, I named it wrong. And that allowed me to build it wrong right off the bat. You know what I mean? I didn't give myself any... Um, any... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's almost you know, like you just said, throw all the database code in here. Yeah, and the I've seen people do that. They say, oh, I follow the repository pattern. I put everything in a repository pattern. And by the way, this breaks the official repository pattern, by the way. But we're not talking about the repository pattern. We're talking about single responsibility principle. Um, and so, so go ahead, I cut you off. You were going to say something. Thank you. No? Uh -huh. Nope, no, no, I, I wasn't going to say anything. Although we so, did get a, a comment that when you, as you were going through methods there, that uh, contrived the X was saying that you can keep delete manager. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm sure most of my team would, you know, would agree on that. Um, uh, lines of code, by the way, also says an easy code smell for sure, right? And I think that's true when it comes to single responsibility principle. When I, I'm not strict, some people say, oh, a method should have you know, 20 lines or, or, or you know, code in it or 10 lines, and that's the max. I don't have a strict rule there, but, I, you know, you know it when it's wrong, right? Certainly when there's, you know, 300 lines, it's wrong, right? And probably not following the single responsibility principle. I've got some more complex examples that I can show you um, that, that, you know, we'll see that kind of code smell. So, so what should a repository look? Yep. So just to comment on this, because you say you kind of know when you see it. So part of this becomes a little bit of culture, right? And making sure that okay. this is how we, how we groom our code, how we, you know, build our applications. The new guy coming on gets a sense of what that is and gets a sense of the 200 line method really doesn't make sense. You know, it's more something that is fits on the width of my screen, let's say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And another thing you talked about uh, culture and all, um, I talk about design principles a lot as great um, food or, you know, whatever you want to call it for code reviews, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times developers say, I'm not really sure what to look for in a code review. Well, here's a great thing to look for in a code review. Like why did someone put all these things into here? And by the way, in my organization, we're introducing standards. And one of our standards is that we follow things like the solid principles, right? And by introducing standards to your organization, you give people something to talk about in code reviews. You get to say, well, hey, that's not our standard, right? Um, and so, you know, that, that's a whole other conversation, but, you know, I kind of like that. Uh, so repository is a problem because I named it repository right off the bat. What should it look like? Well, I would have the employee repository that just has three methods, right? It's, not much more needs to be said. It's, it's kind of similar to the similar to the converter method, converter example. Okay. Now let's take a look at, uh, oh, and so what we've done is we've sort of said, I'm willing to scope this single responsibility of this repository to work with employees only, but do more than one thing with employees. Now, if you wanted to have, um, if you wanted to split this out even further, you know, it'd be hard for me to argue with you to accept that I just find the payoff doesn't really come that much by going even more you know, granular. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look at something like, I just named this thing like a customer, a customer service, right? A service that works with customers. And in this case, we see methods like get customer. This isn't a repository, right? This is a sort of a higher level of abstraction, right? And so we have get customer, add customer, remove customer, update customer, add to shopping cart, right? Oh, well, the customer has a shopping cart. I'm going to add a product into that customer's shopping cart. And that seems to be okay, because it's the customer's shopping cart, right? And then I might say, well, I wanna calculate customer tax records. Now, I, I honestly, 
I don't even know what that is. I just was trying right. to come up with like weird stuff to throw in here. I, I don't know. Calculate customer tax records. Get customer feedback. Get customers by location. Get customers by product group. I'm really like, I was like looking for stuff to put in there. Right. How about this? Like rank customers by feedback. Rank customers by product. Rank customers by region. Let's talk about the definition of the single responsibility principle. And the definition of the single responsibility principle isn't that it should have one thing. Thing that it does, it should have one reason to change. And it's been described that that reason is almost like not even a reason, but a, a who. Who would ask for a change to this class, right? Would it be the marketing department, right? Mm -hmm. Or would it be the uh, an anal analytics team that wants to get like customer data out of here? That sounds like I'm working for multiple teams now, right? I might have more than one reason to change this, this, this class in dramatic ways. And while we have no implementations here, likely we have a bunch of class level variables and things like that, right? Fields, et cetera, shared things that are used, right? And what happens when I start to have real implementations in here and, and variables and things like that is that there's logic in here. Well, whatever the logic is here, right? And there's logic in all these things. And if I decide that the marketing department wants to get uh, customer feedback, I need to come in here and change this class. And I run the risk of breaking something and I might break the customer ranking, right? So. Because of something from the marketing department, I broke something from the anal I broke the you know uh, the analytics team's work. Right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to introduce prob like that's a that's a bad thing. It's bad enough that I broke the marketing thing, right? Uh, and but I don't want to break somebody else's stuff, right? Teams are willing to sort of accept that, like you know, I introduced a bug in the well, no one wants a bug, but it's. Haven't we had different conversations with the team that like asked for the change and, oh, sorry, I introduced a bug. And isn't it a totally different conversation when, uh, you know, I was working on some report for analysis and I broke the uh, authentication feature of some website and they're going, how did you break that? You weren't even working in that code, right? right. Those are different conversations that you don't want to have. Does, does that sort of concept make sense that who, who am I working for? What is the reason for changing this class? Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. I know when you were like, when you were going through all those methods, there was that sense of, yeah, this makes sense, makes sense. And all of a sudden you hit the one about the shopping cart. It's like, that totally seems far into what is in there. And it's like, well, you know, that was, and then you read all the more, more and more ridiculous ones as we went through it, but, and you gave the reasons why they were that way, but it's, it, yeah, to absolutely makes sense. Yeah, I see a lot of comments in here. I want to get to the comments, but I want to show you, so what would I do about this, right? Yep. So what I would probably do is have this uh, customer service uh, class that has the add and the get and the remove and the update. And you know what? Interestingly, I was willing, and you, you called out on this, I was willing to even throw in the shopping cart stuff in here because, and, and I probably wouldn't, right? Mm -hmm. But I would say that's a little more, close to this is customer stuff, but what I would definitely do, wait, wait, where is, oh, here, I would definitely have something like a customer search service to grab some of these methods, right? And the ranking thing, and I put these in one file here for demo purposes. Yeah. The whole thing about not breaking it is these are different classes. These might be in totally different projects and different um, you know, DLLs compiled separately because when we compile, we, we can break something, you know. So if I really want to protect code, I've really got it separated out. But here's like the customer ranking service, right? Let's be specific about the name. This thing's job is to handle those ranking features, right? And you're right. I would probably move out this uh, shopping cart thing, but I was just trying to group these into a few areas like the search stuff, the ranking stuff, and and in this case, I was a little lazy and left those other things in there. But I really liked when I learned that concept of the reason to change. Why might this change? Who might the request be coming from? And, um, you know, things like that.
right? Um, I, I don't know if you guys are following the comments. I see a lot of stuff in there. Did you want to, should we grab something from comments and chat? Yeah. Or? So um, a little earlier we were talking about, you know, that you were implementing a repository, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, I think I see this a lot. Uh, I see, you know, we can, we can hit search engines and we can look for the repository pattern. And I believe that we will find both for and against repository pattern posts and even furthermore for and against generic repository pattern posts. And that that's what this comment from helpful stranger reminded mm -hmm. me of. Um, I guess I'm oh, not I would sure. Use generics. Let's be clear. I would use generics. I would not write this repository. Uh, if okay. that's if that's what helpful stranger is wondering, this is to, this is remember this conversation is not about the repository pattern or about writing better code. Uh, not, not it is about writing better code, but it's not about exact implementations. This is about showing the difference of what is the single responsibility principle. So I, I want to frame it that way. This is not the way I would create a repository. But like you said, Chris, we could find posts for and against that. But that's not the scope of this yeah. conversation. I hope that's okay. No, uh, it is. But and so I'm I'm trying to figure this out too. Is is uh, understanding whether your class has a single reason to change and that slight uh, that that I don't want to call it a pivot, but you call it, you said there's a subtle difference between just that it only does one thing because that's not true. You want the class to have it, it, what you're telling me is I want this class to have one concern. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is it also concern is a great word? Concern is a great word. Yeah. Like we're concerned with employees here. It's the right. scope. So the, is is a way to determine this um, uh, whether or not um, I only have to go one place to make a change? Like somebody comes to us and says, okay, all of our employees, they all had numeric. ID numbers. And it's been that way for 30 years, but we just merged with another company. And at that company, uh, <laughs> you know, 30 years ago, it, it was fine to use an int here, although we didn't have C sharp then, but whatever. Um, it was fine to use an int, no big deal. Uh, but now, you know what, that was kind of a mistake. We're getting this new, um, these new employees that have strings in their IDs. And for whatever reason, we're not going to change them. So the question is, do you do you know that maybe you've done a good job if you don't have to go traipsing through lots of classes? And and when do you when can you look back at, at it from this maintenance fix and say, yeah, we really got that right because I just went to one spot or a limited number of spots? Yeah, it gets tricky when you talk about numbers of spots because um, we're not talking about like nesting code and code that calls other places and and uh, single responsibility is going to actually, some people would say, well, if you don't follow single responsibility, then all the logic is in one spot for a whole process, right? Um, and, and we could talk about a more complex example. Uh, I have this one with this membership service, which is a more complex example. And, and um, But I, I think, you know, and I, I did see a comment that separation of concerns and single responsibility principle, uh, Meg says that, go, go hand in hand. Exactly. Um, by following the single responsibility principle, you sort of automatically get separation of concerns, right? Um, I shouldn't be having UI logic in here. That is not my concern. My concern is to get, in this case, this employee repository, is to work with the data in and outs of employees, right? Um, so that's a good point. If Since yeah. this particular class is seems to be adding to the data store or the repository deleting and getting, right. if it also rendered the HTML, you're on the wrong track. Yeah, totally. And I've seen, um, yeah, I've seen some really bad implementations of, of that, you know, over the years. But I think the really big takeaway is, you know, when I've shown this kind of stuff to people, they, they so they say, oh, okay, Andy, so this is correct. What you're showing me, this is correct. and. It's correct to me. I want to be really clear about that. Like there isn't, I don't, I don't know if there's like a guarantee of this. I think we each have to come up with our interpretation. It's, it goes back to this whole like customer list item converter and, you know, 
this is more single responsibility principle, but what is your tolerance, right? There's a lot of reasons and there's a, you develop like these code smells for things, right? Mm -hmm. Another way I look at this single responsibility principle is I look at the value of, or, or, or sorry, a prevention of merge conflicts, okay? If I'm having merge conflicts, that means, well, I want to be careful. There's a lot of reasons why, you know, why you could have that. But let's just say I'm working on a team. It's, it's the three of us. And Chris, you're working on a feature. I'm working on a feature. Rich is working on a feature, right? We shouldn't have those kind of merge conflicts because we're all in the same files because we're following the single responsibility principle, right? And you're, Chris, you're working on something that has to do with shopping carts, right? And I'm working on membership. And uh, Rich is working on like this customer, you know, crud kind of data, right? Mm -hmm. We're not going to be stepping on each other. We're not going to have changes to the same files, right? Because we've separated out the, the um, you know, like the concern. It's like that separation of concerns, right? Um, I feel like we should show, I should show this other example because I think this other example, it shows a more complex scenario, right? Where you talk about like the whole scope of work. Okay. And so I have this example. I've been using this example for, for years. I have this pretend membership service, right? By the way, I'm a big fan of like that kind of servicey, if you hadn't noticed, like servicey kind of things. So we've got this method called join. And imagine, yeah, and by the way, I just happened to glance and see the bottom of the uh, chat where NFG Codex says no one person can have all the answers. It's, it's really true. As a team, people have to kind of come together and agree upon like their tolerance, right? How far do we want to go with these things, right? But um, we've got, imagine we have a website and we have this thing where it is, you can, you can join and be a member of whatever this thing is. And so join takes a username and password. Now I can tell you, I've written, not in the exact details of this, but I've written code that looked like this a lot, right? Maybe at the beginning, don't worry about this. I'm just getting some sort of like access to my database. And then what do I do? I go into my user validation and I say, oh, and by the way, this validation is, is horrific, right? The point isn't how good this validation is. The point is, oh, I'm going to validate this username. I'm going to make sure that the length is right and that it doesn't contain an at, uh, has to contain an at because, you know, the username has to be an email address. This is my little hacky demo code here. Oh, and it has to be a complex password. So if the, if the password is less than five characters, we're going to throw an exception, right? So I've got validation. First thing that I do in my method. And then I keep going, right? I want to check to make sure that user doesn't exist already. So I'm going to look to see if that username is taken already. And if it is, I'm going to throw an exception. Again, we're not talking about should you throw exceptions or should you not throw exceptions. We're talking about that the scope of work in this is getting complicated. Okay. Then I have to convert. I have to take this user, this username and turn it into this user object. Right. And then I have to add that user to my Context again doesn't matter if you use entity framework or not. I'm, I'm adding this thing to my database is what I'm doing here, right? And I'm saving the changes. And then just to make it really fun, we send out a welcome message. And so we got to go in here and we format a welcome message and we say the subject and the body and the username. And then we have our SMTP client and we hit send on the message, right? This is that this is a little different from that like single feature thing. Like I've got a lot of stuff to do and this code, quite frankly, would probably be much longer if I was doing real validation on here. Right. And really having some fields on here and all this and this. So going back to the, why would this change and how would this break? So the marketing department calls up and says, you know, Andy, that welcome message you're sending, is nice, but it's a little vanilla. Um, can we get some HTML formatting in here at least, right? And maybe include the user's name, right? Clearly this is is ridiculous and this is just demoware, right? But they want me to come in here and add like HTML and maybe make the message a nice font and stuff like that. So I come in here because the marketing department asks for that and I'm in here. And when I did that, I made a mistake and let's just say somehow it still compiles, you know, whatever. It gets through this thing. And I just broke registration because we were changing the format of the email message. To me, 
that is a really good example of the single responsibility principle and having only one reason to change, right? This, this method has so many reasons why it might change. I might want to change the validation logic, et cetera, et cetera. Like I probably don't even need to talk about it. Like this should just jump out at you guys yeah. as being, um, you know, and so, um, and you know, so Meg is, is hitting on it. I, I'm sorry if I'm all, it's easy for me to see the bottom, uh, item of the chat, but there's certainly ways that we, we would separate this out. Right. And, and I can show you what this would look like. Um, I would do something like this. Now, keep in mind, I want to be really careful here. Some people are going to say you shouldn't new things up in here. This breaks all kinds of other principles. This isn't, but the principle we're talking about here is the single responsibility principle. I just want to be clear about that. And in other future shows, we can talk about even better ways to do this. But what did I do? I created a membership validator and its job is to take that code Take this code and quite frankly, copy and paste it and put it over here in this membership validator, right? Simple as that. Just drop it in there. It's a different class. It's not all in the same file. Now I've got a single responsibility membership validator and I call it and I ask it to do its thing. And I have all these different things. And of course I have the message formatter down here. And this is its own class in its own file, maybe even in its own library. And so when the marketing department comes and says, hey, we got to be able to do something better with that message. Sure, I can do that. I'll come in here and change this thing to, you know, as much as you want. There's no chance in me breaking all those other features, right? And so I just want to, does, does, that, does that jive with what everybody thinks is the single responsibility principle? Because this to me is like the classic example. So when you go back to your membership service, yep. originally, I think you you pointed out that it was doing a lot of different things. It was validating the user and it was sending the email and it was, and your feeling is, what, what you're telling us is, is that each of those jobs, you, you could disconnect them. They could be almost like different, you, you could almost have different lieutenants that are responsible for each of these things. A security officer that validates the user, yes. a, uh, a, a postal officer that sends the email. And so once you have that abstraction in your mind, you've already given them different personas. So that's sort of leading you towards, hey, I need different places for these things. It could be classes in C-sharp, functions in a language that doesn't have classes at all, or the, or the C-sharp and Java version of classes. Just get it out of here, different library, um, things like that, right? I, I feel yes. like that's kind exactly. of... I keep coming back to how I'm trying to detect this stuff. And earlier you sort of said we can detect it in some ways with Git. If it causes a merge conflict and two people need to change the same code, then maybe we're detecting. <laughs> and you know me, if I can use Git to solve a problem, that's right in my wheelhouse. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And and I uh, glancing through chat, I saw earlier people talking about um, – code analyzers that look at things like cyclical complexity, right? There are things that can say this class has too many, if this method has too many if statements. And I also saw a joke in there about if statements and, you know, so last year. And yeah, we're breaking all kinds of, or, or we are or not breaking all kinds of other rules, but that's not what this show is about. But yeah, there are other ways to, to validate some of these things. Cyclical complexity is a good, is a potentially good, indicator of a uh, single responsibility principle being broken, right? There are analyzers for that. There are uh, what Chris just talked about again with, you know, um, conflicts and, and merge problems. There are a whole bunch of different sort of, and, and then there are all these smells that we, we talk about. We use that word code smell. And for those people that are new to that phrase, it's when you're looking at the code and you're like, something just doesn't smell right to me, right? I yeah. love that phrase, code smell. Yeah. Um, and so, I just want to point out that Meg shared this code smell detector for Ruby that while you were talking, I went and peeked at. And yeah. it's amazing in that the author or this project has documented the code smells. And then you like run this sort of like linter, except it's so much more than a linter. <laughs> oh, yeah. wow. Because it's running around saying, you know, it's looking through your code and saying, yeah, um, 
this isn't this isn't good. <laughs> so I was just impressed by that project. That was amazing to me. Yeah. No, that, that sounds really cool. Um, now, I, I also sort of glanced through chat, you know, quickly, and I saw some comments about people saying things like, you know, valid valid concerns. There's no way to get around. There's always going to be cross-cutting concerns that you need to share across features or across teams and things like that. We're not saying throw that out. I'm not saying don't ever, oh, God, we don't want to break, um, we don't want to break, you know, marketing needs a customer and sales needs a customer. So we should write that database logic twice and, you know, duplicate code because, you know, let them change it each on their own. Like, I'm not saying to do that. Now, maybe there's a use case where that's a good idea too, you know, because there's there's a lot of ways to do this. But it's about, you know, sort of being practical and trying to minimize conflict where we can, right? And thinking about what's the best way to do this. But certainly there's going to be data access points that are really going to bubble themselves up through multiple, you know, sort of scopes or things like that. Um, I still think, you know, that's good code. That's good code writing, right? You don't want to have duplication of code. And so single responsibility principle, I would say that's a, there's a little bit of a problem there where there have been times where I'll admit, uh, well, I want to admit a couple things here, but I'll admit that I've rewritten code that maybe I shouldn't have rewritten, meaning like duplicated it because maybe I was going too far with single responsibility principle, right? And the other thing I want to admit real quick, um, because I always find it's important. I hate to sound holier than thou. People are like, well, you know, those of us that do demos, you know, people will say, oh, you know, you know all this stuff and I don't know all this stuff. I didn't always know all this stuff. I can tell you that several, well, more than a few years ago, because I've been doing this stuff for a while here, I wrote classes that looked an awful like this, right? And anyone who says they didn't like start doing stuff like this in, at some point in their career, like, Cut the holier than now crap, honestly, right? Because I've done this. Uh, I, I'm I'm proud to say that I, I think it's better the way I do things now, which is a little bit more like this, right? But but you know, none of this should make anyone feel bad about the work they're doing today, right? We want to make people better, but it's not um, you know, there's no judgment, right? This is a judgment free zone, right, guys? Absolutely. Um, so, um, you know, Chris, you've, you know, we've had that conversation, like, you know, you've said on some of these principles, like, I'm not really sure where to draw the line. Right. Okay. And I hear that, you know, so often. Um, and the bottom line is it's about like developing code smells. It's about working with a team and maybe agreeing upon like a style, like how far, uh, what what like sort of tolerance do we have on some of these things? Um, you know, uh, and not all code needs to follow the single responsibility principle either, right? People will say, like, I broke all kinds of best practices in these demos, right? Some people get really mad. You do a demo and it has to be perfect. Like, maybe demos don't need to follow a single responsibility principle, right? I'm just writing a quick utility or whatever I'm doing. Well, I mean, uh, and isn't I that the issue, though, right, is that you come to a – so you just said how difficult it is to cover the solid principles in an hour, like in a conference talk. And here we've spent an hour talking just about S, and it still feels like, wow, we could spend another afternoon trying to, trying to decide, hey, this is a good example, this isn't a good example, um, and we're using demo code. And boy, isn't the world different when you're faced with real requirements and real managers and real schedules and real deadlines and, and real, we actually want to ship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so if I, if I do a talk on the larger, you know, five principles all at once, you know, often some of the, the uh, feet, you know, so, sort of some of the guidance I give to people is start small, take some baby steps. It's like you said, you know, we've got jobs to do. We've got deadlines to hit. And when you're good at this, yeah, I can write this code quickly, right? But when it's new to you, it takes a little while and you're going to write your code and you're going to be like, this isn't so perfectly single responsibility. And I would say, is it better than what you did yesterday? Right. Um, and uh, 
in the interest of shipping this product, you know, is there, are there some places where you think, wow, I'd like to make that a little bit more single responsibility? Yeah, but you're learning. And um, these things, you know, it's so easy, it's so easy for me to say like, oh, you know, you develop some smells and it's easy to recognize where single responsibility is right. And I, I hate myself for saying that word easy. A lot of people say like a presenter should never use the word easy <laughs> because it's, it's, this stuff's all complicated, you know, um, it's, it's stuff's complicated, but I really like it. Um, I also see comments there about CQRS. What a cool pattern that is. Um, I'd love to have a show um, and have someone come on and do it. I am not qualified to do it. Oh, know, yeah. I don't think CQRS. so either. I mean, but you know, if you look at separation and stuff is, right. is um, it's that gets single responsibility, by the way, right? Where you're basically saying, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite different than this kind of stuff, but you're saying that we're going to separate the command from the query, right? And so if I'm saving a customer, that thing doesn't even return the customer because it doesn't know how to get a customer. It only knows how to save the customer, right? Like stuff yeah. like that. Well, your read, you know, what, what you read from is different from what you write to. Yep. Yeah. And, and you're, you've separated, oh, yeah, yeah, totally. you know, you, and look, I, I can't say that I'm an expert on this, but I've just really what I've done is, is Microsoft publishes some of these patterns. And so, you know, I, I've read through a lot of them, but like, uh, I think the point of CQRS is to say, instead of trying to write the system that knows how to both take the order, write the order, and and then read the orders back, you separate all of those things into separate services. Um, you also give up things that maybe if you're a little bit older that you're used to when you use products like SQL Server, you're used to, to consistency and ACID compliance. And you're probably giving that up in a system like that because you've decoupled it all. Um, I don't know if by itself that necessarily leads you to single responsibility. I just don't know because uh, <laughs> you, you sit down to try and, and write some code and sometimes the easiest thing to do is to bang out, do this, then do this, and do this, and do this, and, you, and it works. And then uh, it even kind of passes the code review and then you come back and look at it later and realize wow, that was a lot of different varied things to do that we all kind of threw in one place now. Right. Yep. You know, so one way I, I solved that problem, by the way, uh, and I, I want, um, yeah, I, I feel like I, I want to keep this conversation going, but I, I want to take a break to say something here. You know, to, we've got a bunch of people here watching and commenting and how uh, this is fun for me and, and I hope everyone's having a good time. If you're here for the first time, and, and uh, you know, follow us on, on Twitch, right? We would appreciate a follow. If you happen to be watching this uh, after the fact on YouTube, you know, subscribe and, and give us a like on the video. I've been watching YouTubers lately and they all go like, pound on that like video, you know, destroy that, uh, th that like button and stuff. Like, you know, we don't get quite that uh, animated, but, um, you know, follow us on uh, Twitter and maybe even join the meetup, which we have a meetup which is, uh, it feels a little almost antiquated. It's sort of not a very Twitch streamy kind of thing to do, but it's a good place for us to have our schedule and uh, certainly not required to RSVP or anything like that, but nope, that's true. Um, you, you can kind of see what's going on. Um, and I don't know if we have any other plugs, but I want to come back to this conversation. Do you have anything else we want to just mention while, while we're, you know, like that kind of so, stuff? So, you know, a little bit earlier, um, let's see if I can find it here. We, we sort of, snuck into code reviews. I, I don't know that we meant to, um, but it came up very briefly. And NFG Codex had said, um, <laughs> I, and I want to make sure I've got this right. I, I'm pretty sure this was in relation to that conversation about code reviews was um, <clears throat> start at the end, work to the beginning. Uh, and, and because instead that if you're focusing on syntax by reading it front to back, then you know, you're you're not basically figuring out what the code does. You're just kind of like reading how the code works. I mm. think I'm not sure. Syntax identifies the nitpicks and obvious bad practices. So um, I think that's interesting. Start at the end, work back to the beginning, then read it front to back and focus on the logic. So start at the. Oh, I see. I get it now. If you start at the end, you're not going to read. Okay. So I had to read this again. In fact, I think I got this better when I read it backwards. I should have started at the end of the message. 
is by starting at the end when reviewing the code, you're going to focus on uh, the syntax. And then when you go from front to, to back, from top to bottom, you're going to focus on the logic. Yeah. He, he, he said it better. I should have just put well, it up there and said presented, presented without horrible analysis <laughs> from Chris. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we, I think code reviews, you know, is it would be a great show as well, by the way. Um, I like, you know, hearing, and again, like we have our, each have our own opinions on things and then we would hear our opinions from, uh, you know, our, our, our family out there, I could say our viewers, but like our family, you know, everyone that's, that's a part of the show, like, you know, throwing in ideas and stuff like that. It's, it's great to hear, um, you know, other people's, uh, like tips like that. I mean, that's the whole point of what we're trying to do. What I, you know, we said earlier is like this community. It's not just us talking. It's not a single presenter presenting his point of view. This show is a discussion, right? And, and it's perfectly fine for people to say, I don't think what you did here is, is single responsibility enough for me, or it's too much for me. That's fine. Right. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of interpretation, but um, Chris, you were talking about, go back, where was that? You were talking about how, you know, you start writing code and you find that all of a sudden it's like, it's not very single responsibility. You just started writing it, right? A lot of times what I do when I'm writing something like this is I, I try to write code. If I'm going to write this join thing, I'm going to start out with a bunch of comments, right? I'm going to say, what do I want to do? I want to do validate. You know, like I don't write the code. I a lot of times do this. Well, then I want to do, I want to save it. And then I'll go, no, next thing I got to do is I got to convert it, you know, and stuff like that. And then I'll say, I got to send a message. Whoa, look at that. I want to, um, I see chat like blowing up over there to send a message. And so then I'll go, oh, you know what? I should probably format that message because you can't send a message that doesn't exist, right? And when I do that, I then take a look at these things and I've got my, I've got my, my methods right there. I got my classes right there. If I think about each of the things I need to do and then I can say, okay, let's go build a validator. Let's go build a converter. Right. Um, that's a way that I approach it. And I don't know if that kind of concept would help. Um, Chris, you know, I don't know if that would help or not. But that is a way that I often get to having this, you know, code that's yeah. more single responsibility. So what kind of works for me, okay, is although I'm not going to say that when I do this, it's because I'm thinking single responsibility. It's that, but I feel like I kind of get to the same place is that you've written a comment that says I need to validate, convert, save, format, and send a message. And I think if I'm following you correctly, then what you're saying is that I should see just maybe five or six lines of code that go off and do those things by the parties that are responsible, the classes that are yeah. responsible, whatever, the services that are responsible. Yeah. Um, to me, I think when I translate that in my brain, it's that I want to read this code like a book and I literally want it to say validate, maybe uh, validate and then maybe username and password is in parentheses so that it's like I'm reading the instructions. I could read this out loud to a yeah, non-programmer right non or a business person. Take away right? this first part, right? Yeah. Take away this thing. And it says what I'm going to do. I'm going to validate the user. Right. I'm going to add, this could be named better, add user, yeah. right? Or save user to database, you know, whatever you want to sure. call it. Format a message and send a notification. This code reads so well because of the way it's, there's, there's almost... Again, this is demo where I didn't, I didn't make this perfect here, but the next developer that comes in six months from now or or me coming back two months from now, because I tell you what, I always forget what the heck I was doing from two months ago. There's no question about what's going on here, right? Yeah. Um, if you, you can show in, the code. Go ahead. I was going to say, if you come in and you and you lay that skeleton or that framework out of what you want to do, you're no longer looking at a blank class. And you at least then have a roadmap to say, these are the things I've got to continue on with. Which I think yeah. can be one of those things that when you're looking at, it's like, well, how do I keep things separate? And you're thinking about that instead of thinking, well, what do I really need to, to kind of put into this bit of work that I'm trying to get done? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, a lot of, a lot of times people think about, uh, another, another way of looking at this, by the way, one of the first things I learned when I was, uh, you know, doing, you know, C sharp and, and that, or probably even when I was doing Java, like way back in the beginning is like, Oh, turn this into a method, right? Add, have something like private, you know, private validate, right? Uh, whoops, I don't know what this was, private void, it wouldn't be void, right? But validate, right? And if we remember those skills that we learned early on, like take these things and break this method into having private methods, right? Um, and then all this code goes in this, in this validator thing here, right? Well, all you do now is take those, take that private validate. First of all, I hate private. I like to have everything be public, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, so take this validate, um, sorry, take this validate method and now just take it out and make it a class, right? And now it's the validator class that has a validate method in it. Um, and those are skills that people tend to learn pretty early on in like software development, I think, is like that whole private method mentality. mentality. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if, if, if that kind of helps people as well to say, well, just take those private methods and get them out of there. Now, there's a whole other bunch of reasons why you might want to do that, you know, and things like that. Now, by the way, a couple other things we could talk about here. The first thing I want to talk about that we didn't cover is people say, this class, I've heard, I've heard this from people, right? And it's a pretty good, uh, pretty understandable thing to say, well, this method breaks the single responsibility principle. This method does five different things. And yeah, it certainly does. It does five different things. But again, something has to call these things, right? So I always say this thing, this join method has one job to do. Its job is to orchestrate the actions needed to become a member, right? Yeah, it's just go back to your orchestrators. You, yeah, and you've heard me talk about like orchestrator, yeah. orchestration pattern, orchestrator pattern, right? Those things, right? Something has to do that. This thing, the only reason that this method would change. What reason would this method or this class have to change if the overall process changed? Not if validation changed, but we decide, you know what? We no longer validate users. Okay, I know where to go to change that. This thing's job is to manage the orchestration, to manage the flow. Maybe we wanna say that we're gonna, if if validation fails, we wanna send a new notification that, you know, sorry, your validation failed. I, I mean, I'm making stuff up, right? But okay, then I'm gonna re-change the orchestration here, right? This thing has a job to do. Its job is to orchestrate. Um, and <laughs> I'll orchestrate the orchestration Chris, is that what you're making fun of me that I love the word? No, I, I think that if I remember correctly, when we talked about uh, dev team standards and you were actually presenting some of your common standards that you like to, you, you, they've become reliable for you. I believe that's the first time that we heard the term orchestrators on this show. And I wanted to call out that video. Oh, oh you did. Oh, that's cool. Oh, excellent. Yeah, um, that all plays upon this whole concept. Like you have to have something that, um, drives things, right? So I tend to break things up and I call these little things like, you know, I call them like, um, these are like the, some people call these the workers. Like these are the things that do the work, right? They know how to do stuff, right? I tend to call them like little microservices or something like that, but it, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what we call them, um, mini service, you know, whatever. So that was something I wanted to bring up. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up, uh, I've written it down. Um, I remember saying, oh, there's two other things I want to bring up. And I don't remember what the other one was. So maybe we talk and it'll pop into my head. But, you know, the concern about like, how is this single responsibility? Well, it is. Yeah. And then, and then you have microservices, right? And you could turn these into microservices. Um, uh, true microservice architecture is quite different than me just 
you know, ripping these out and making them their own little services, right? Um, but I think that microservices is sort of single responsibility principle in um, in a different scope, right? Because that's what you're doing. You're saying this service is responsible for saving. When I say the service, I mean, we've got a server running a API and it only does that one thing, right? But that's all related to single responsibility. I mean, I think that that same thing is there at, at the core. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wish I could remember what that other thing I wanted to bring up was. Um, that's a bummer. Written it down. So, um, yeah. I mean, I think single responsibility principles is cool stuff, you know. All right. So, so yeah. You know, whether you're watching us on, on YouTube in some future um, – or if you are watching us right now on Twitch, you know, let us know what you think. We got a lot of great comments tonight, and don't hesitate to comment down below here on the on the YouTube video. Um, if you really like this video and you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the thumbs up so that we know these are the kind of topics that you uh, that you want us to uh, keep working on. And and if you hit the subscribe button on YouTube, then you'll get notifications when new shows go up. Usually comes. Uh, after we finish recording here and doing this live, it usually takes a day or two to get it over to YouTube, not because of how slow the internet is at Rich Ross's place. It's just because we do kind of uh, polish up the video, trim it up. There's a difference between the live production and what's great for a YouTube viewer who doesn't want to watch the five minutes of the stream starting uh, graphic and music, right? They they want to they want to get into it. Um, we also try to provide show notes. So some of the things that folks mentioned in chat, we're going to gather up. And um, some of the things that we talked about here, we'll, we'll get those web pages together, things like that. So, you know, I would say this was a pretty, pretty successful, great return for the Dev Talk Show. Again, season two, uh, this is year two for us. If you missed us at the beginning, saying that we, we our first episode was August 7th of 2019, when we used to record live at the Microsoft MTC in Malvern. In fact, this whole Thing started because the Philly.net user group meets out of there twice a month and has twice yearly code camps. And we just thought, you know, why don't we go into the studio there and do a show afterwards? Let's have the parking lot conversation uh, at the MTC right after the show. And so, you know, times have changed a little bit and we can't have the hallway track the way we used to. So the hallway track has come to Twitch and YouTube, right? Absolutely. Um, so definitely, thanks for, for being here on that respect. Now, I want to make sure, uh, I know, Rich, you wanted to do this. You wanted, we've had a lot of viewers tonight, that, that folks that we have met for the first time tonight. Um, some regulars, people we know, we, we know them personally, and then others who are just regulars to our channel. And thank you all for being here, for being here. Yeah. Uh, but what I want to say is, is we have some new folks who followed the channel. Yeah. Oh, cool. So we have about 13 over the last, uh, since we did an announcement that we're coming back, but some actually just now. So I'm going to go kind of in reverse order for those who are just here. So Notorious. You've got to get the animation set up, right? Uh, yeah. We did all the other animation tonight. So that one we'll have for next week. Uh, but yeah. uh, Notorious XX04, uh, Top Swag Code, Rebel Zoo finally following us over here. He, he was a longtime mixer watcher. So we had him over there. Oh, so. okay. NFG Codex, uh, Scrabble. Chops, uh, mycotic, my, yeah, mycotic, uh, adra, ad, adra, adrational, <laughs> okay, uh, Sazum, uh, Meg, Megachal, and uh, Arkuzadu. Uh, so that's kind of what's been going over back since uh, kind of the beginning of the week here. But great for, I uh, thank you everybody for following. Uh, sorry we had to compile them all at the end. Hopefully you're all still here watching and uh, hopefully. We, well, I know this show would not have been at least for good for me as it was without all the, the comments in the chat. And you guys are what yeah. makes the show. So thank you for doing that. Well, yeah. What are we talking about next week? We should also plug, right? That's right. That's yeah, right. And it. so one thing I do want to do is is, is very early on in the show. Um, and, and again, it always sounds better in rehearsal. Let's just read the usernames of the folks that, that followed us. And then you actually go to do it and you realize that you're going to completely mess up um, – uh, Monahan or maybe Monahan you or Monahanu's statement thanking us for the videos on the YouTube channel and thank you for watching them and please let us know what we can do to help you. 
you see the three of us a lot, but if you watch some of those videos at video.youtube.com, uh, you'll see that we had some guests. We had Kevin Griffin talking yeah. about Azure Logic Apps. We had uh, Sarah Dukevich talking about, um, and I had to pull that pronunciation from somewhere in my memory again. bank. I, and I got it. Uh, at least Duke I'm, is not here, but she boy, I better. Probably. At least let me put it right. Let me put it this way. I better have gotten it. Uh, she showed us Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and we have some guests that, that are eager to come on. We're just kind of getting back into the, the flow here with this five-part series on the solid principles. This week, week S for single responsibility. So that means O is for... Open closed principle. Open closed principle. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, okay. And, you know, I, again, I think that's a one that there's a lot of like cool stuff we can talk about with that. And and so knowing that we're going to be talking about that, everybody that's watching now, think about like maybe your some of your examples that, you know, that you have. And maybe, you know, when we you could be, be prepped for like comments next time, like, you know, ideas and how how we should or should not apply the open closed principle, you know. Yeah, right. You know, Contrived DX points out that he saw an episode with Carl Franklin, which was oh, yeah. an, an honor, a privilege, and so much fun to speak to Carl Franklin, who I think it's fair to say is responsible for this show even existing by paving the way with with uh, with .NET Rocks and, and everything Absolutely. that he and Richard have done. So I, I will always tell them that. I will always tell you that, that this show would not be possible without um, folks like uh, um, uh, Suze Hinton, right? Did I, did I get that right? Um, mm -hmm. Boy, my brain's, <clears throat> for some we reason, I'm drawing on, a blank. Twitch, right? She was uh, one of the who, first. Who streamed developers. on Twitch. She was the very first person I saw coding on Twitch, and I said, this is absolutely brilliant. Uh, this is just wonderful to see technology on Twitch. And then, of course, our good friend here, also from the Southeast Philly uh, area, Jeff Fritz, C Sharp Fritz here on Twitch, who codes three, four, five times a week. You've got to check him out. It's Fritz mm. and Friends coding with uh, pair programming with the cloud. Um, yeah. But thank you for joining us. We're here on Twitch, 8.30 p.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern time, but you can always catch what we've done in the past at YouTube. Yeah, I mean, we should put up our Twitter handles, too, um, on the chat, right, in case people want to follow us. We have, uh, I'm typing this in here, at the Dev Talk Show. Uh, will it do at because it's going to think I'm trying to talk? Will it put that in? Yeah, that's the at the Dev Talk Show on Twitter, right? And I'm yep. at, uh, at Schwami. Right. I mean, and Rich joined me on my stream here. On, on Twitch, my handle is, is Space Shot, which is, a, as you've seen in the chat, it's my longtime Xbox Live handle. I've had it for absolutely forever. Space and uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, you'll find me everywhere there. But, you know, just to just say, like, Top Swag Code trolled us a little bit about the, the end of Mixer, but I, I definitely did one last stream on Mixer and, 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 and gave it a good tribute and send off because that was the platform that got me into streaming. Uh, on myself so i will never forget what that platform did for me but we're here we're here and we're going to be this uh community uh and yeah like chop says you know that that's been I, i'm pretty sure i can go back even longer than 20 years with that handle back to dial up bbs's and uh knowing which um bod speed i had connected to just by the sound of the the modem was that 300 baud or 1200 baud oh that sounds like 1200 well to be so, fair i feel like i gotta one up you a little bit because people have been calling me Schwami from a uh, long time. Although Rich can probably say people have been calling him Rich Ross since the day he was born, right? And so his handle is probably the most, uh, you know, oldest, right? Well, common, yeah. Although I don't have just Rich Ross, so that that happens, but. Oh, uh, yeah. Your Twitter handle is what? I, I typed it's in Rich Ross. Yeah, Rich it's Ross. got an underscore yeah. in there. So I was why. trying to do that. I was trying to do that, and it thought I was trying to type at you. So um, these are that's your Twitter handle there, there. Tross. Yeah. Um, All right. So. So awesome. So once again, yeah. thank you everybody tonight for all the follows. Thank you to Andy for putting together the slides, the code, and leading the way on single responsibility. Uh, 
what a lot of you may or may not know if you're new um, is is Rich put so much effort behind the scenes, the wonderful displays you're looking at, the audio, uh, switching scenes, putting up the desktop of the person who's presenting, and it just looks like it's all planned and it's a wonderful TV production that we spent hours prepping when in reality, he just reads our minds and knows what to do next. So kind of right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. No, it's, it's a lot of fun. That's why, we, that's why I'm say, happy I mean, to be back. The new, the new look, uh, Rich, that you came up with the new screens really looked great. I'm, I'm really liking the new layout. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. We want to do something different to, to show that we're in year two. So. Yep. Yep. So um, I think that'll do it for this episode here, our August 12th, uh, beginning of year two. And you know what? Let's hope let's hope that uh, that this is that someday we'll look back at year two and say, remember, remember when. But for right now, everyone out there watching, thank you for joining us. We had a great turnout on Twitch tonight. We hope to have a great turnout on YouTube. Please watch, subscribe, follow, comment. Let us know uh, what you think. And we'll see you uh, next time. Um, next Wednesday, 8.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern, when we cover the open close principle and begin to start putting out the schedule for some of the guests that we're just getting in place for later this year so that the learning just keeps going. And we can't wait to see you again next time for Andy Schwamm and Rich Ross. I'm Chris Gomez, and you have been watching The Dev Talk Show.